Hello, my dear friends of warmth. Uh, we are coming to a very important day in the practice of theragnostics, which is called the World Theragnostics Day, being celebrated on 31st of March every year. So this year as well, we'll be celebrating the World Theragnostics Day and to mark the auspicious day or the landmark day of the practice of theragnostics, warmth has prepared a poster which depicts the whole journey of theragnostics from the first time when it started till as we are going on today. It was actually quite long back in uh, 1941 when Saul Hertz first used the concept of theragnostics to treat a patient of thyroid cancer. It was initially called an atomic cocktail then, meaning that uh, use an atomic or a radioactive medicine to treat cancer. And that was a case of thyroid cancer, which was treated with radioactive iodine. Time went by and uh, radioactive iodine became the mainstay of treatment of thyroid cancer after the initial surgical management. And for the past so many years, radioiodine has retained its place in the treatment of thyroid cancer. And that was the world's first example of theragnostics where we saw what we treated and we treated what we saw. Similar principle is going on today as well. The only thing is we have added many more radionuclides. We have added many more radiopharmaceuticals to the armamentarium of theragnostics. We moved on and uh, theragnostics became applicable and it's a mainstay of uh, one of the mainstays of treatment in cancer today. The notable example being uh, the treatment of castration resistant prostate cancers, CRPC, where the radioligand PSMA has been added to lutetium and actinium. And uh, there has been a very good results of theragnostics in treatment of prostate cancer. Similarly, for neuroendocrine tumors, this has again become the one's uh, mainstay of treatment. Well, again, as we began with radioactive iodine, and we have still maintained the radioactive iodine as a pivotal uh, radiotherapy, internal radiotherapy for treatment of thyroid cancer, the protocols have gone undergone some changes. The tumors have undergone certain changes. There are many thyroid cancer tumors which have become radioiodine resistant or they have become radioiodine refractory. However, still radioactive iodine as a theragnostic agent has remained the mainstay of treatment. It's only that we have added more and more as combination treatment. Similarly, for other theragnostic uh, areas of management in other cancers, there has been a lot of trials which are going on which has been shown in a theragnostic uh, posters. There has been controlled trials and the theragnostic plan of treatment in prostate cancer and neuroendocrine tumors have uh, is only going ahead day by day. So therefore, friends, on this suspicious day of the World Theragnostic Day, I congratulate all my nuclear medicine colleagues who are in the practice of uh, this modality of treatment. And I must tell you that each and every day, every month, probably one or two centers all over the globe are being added as a theragnostic uh, center for the treatment of these sort of disease. Once again, all the very best from warmth for this auspicious day. Thank you very much.
Hi, I'm Josh Mailman. I'm the CEO of um, WARMP, the World Association of Radio Molecular Therapy. We're here on the third World Theranostics Day, and it really is a day where we celebrate the first therapy, the first Theranostics therapy that was done in 1941 on March 31st by Dr. Saul Hertz. And, and I'm really pleased to be um, joined here today by Dr. Hertz's daughter, um, Barbara Hertz. And so Barbara, welcome. And I know Thank this you. really is a, uh, is a, a day. day. <laughs> it's not only the third um, World Theranostics Day, but it's even more special in that it's the 80th um, benchmark since the first therapeutic use of a radioactive substance to diagnose and to treat cancer, which uh, eventually led to the uh, treatment for cancer. And my dad, Dr. Saul Hertz, lived a very short life from 1905 to 1950. He conceived and brought from bench to bedside RAI, radioiodine, for medical uses. In 1936, he spontaneously asked a very simple question at a lecture just one year after artificial radioactivity was acknowledged with the Nobel Prize in 1935. And his question was, could iodine be made radioactive artificially? Um, that uh, stimulated in 1937 lab studies that led to radioiodine being able to trace the physiology of the thyroid. And at that time of the preclinical studies, they he collaborated with an MIT physicist, Dr. Arthur Roberts, and they utilized something called dosimetry, which was able to determine a specific dose that was necessary for each patient. So this established precision um, oncology. At that time, he was considering um, the use of radioiodine for thyroid cancer, which he further extended in thinking that if he could utilize the radioactive iodine as a tracer and as a diagnostic therapeutic means of treating thyroid cancer, it would hold the key for other forms of cancer. And indeed, he um, started uh, working with nuclear fission to cure other forms of cancer. And he expected that as radioiodine research developed in the field of cancer and leukemia, that other radioactive medicines would come along. And so they have. So Barbara, I know the other picture other than the, the picture of your father is um, him with his assistant um, in front of the multiscalar device. Yes. You, uh, that was um, kind of the first idea of dosimetry for well, um, it was, it was the machine. It's actually the machinery. That's a very insightful question. It's the machinery used to do uptake testing, which was essential to um, utilizing dosimetry. Um, they actually used a Geiger counter um, on the uh, preclinical studies and um, in treating um, cancer uh, with a radioactive substance for other uh, cancers, maybe other than the thyroid cancer, dosimetry really is essential. Um, so one, I want to thank you um, for giving us, us this background. And, and as a patient with neuroendocrine tumors, I know how important this discovery um, you know, led to further discoveries and, and treatments in neuroendocrine tumors. Um, I really also like to bring in um, Teresa Wickingham from um, Thikai, who is the program coordinator and a 46 year survivor of thyroid cancer. Teresa, I know that you represent uh, or you work with thousands of um, thyroid patients from you know, the United States and around the world. And, what has this innovation meant to those with thyroid cancer? Uh, well, that it has saved lives, uh, multiple thousands of people's lives. Um, so we are so grateful to Mr. Hertz and his discovery. The, without it, I mean, many would have died, uh, definitely. Uh, I received it 23 years ago, and um, I'm living proof that it is it works. So we're very thankful. 
And I know you and I work together to um, bring forward nuclear therapies and this idea of theranostics to, um, to patients uh, as part of our work with the Society of Nuclear Medicine and molecular imaging, where it's used now in thyroid cancer, it's used in neuroendocrine tumors, it's, we, we're now seeing it used in, in prostate cancer with some studies that have done, um, that have just completed both in imaging where we have an FDA approval and in, um, uh, in, and in actually treatment of, of metastatic um, prostate cancer. So really, um, Barbara, we wanna th uh, thank you for, for the work that you've done to highlight this and as patients, we're really grateful for all the for all the work you've done and the work that your father started so many years ago. Well, back at you, Josh, for um, sh sharing this story, but more importantly, for um, initiating your work and um, stimulating the research and the treatment of uh, cancer with other radionuclides. Thank you very much. And thank you, Teresa, for joining us as well. And thank you, Barbara. My name is Liepe. I'm an expert for the radio zynovectomy, and I think I have treated more than 20,000 joints up to this time. Radio zynovectomy is a good therapeutic option in different kinds of joint synovitis. We inject some very small particles into the joints, then, say, then we have a homogeneous distribution in the whole joint, and after that, the macrophages phagocytize these particles, and then the macrophages uh, move to the depths of the synovia, a uh, synovia membrane, and over a long time, we have a restoration of the synovial membrane, stop inflammation, stop of effusion, and stop of pain. What are the typical indications? Rheumatoid arthritis, but in the last time, with introducing of the biological, it changed more the osteoarthritis also a very good indication, and we have no good uh, drug uh, treatment uh, for an effective uh, therapeutic effect. Then we have the pigmented villanotylacinovitis. Here we performed a surgical zynovectomy, 
and six weeks later, a radiosinovectomy, good indication is joint display replacement with chronic effusion, and also sometimes you can use it also as a palliative pain therapy if the patients are not fit for a joint replacement. Very important for a good therapeutic effect is a good pre-therapeutic diagnostic. We performed an uh, early scan, scan five minutes after injection, but you will uh, differentiate it between here, the EP policies and the MCP2. Then you need a local scan of the hand and you will look for the different MTP joint. You need a local scan of the foot and for the ankle, you need a lateral scan and you can see here, Arthritis in the articulatio cunonavicularis, that is the subtarsal joint. That is a typical therapy day. We uh, prepare all the syringe for the, for the treatment, and we have 40 to 60 treated joints per therapy day. And some example of a good localization of the needle every time you should be using the X-ray. That is the best place to inject uh, in the shoulder, that's the best place to inject the uh, acromioclavicular joint. And here on the elbow, you can inject it at this size or this size. Here the wrist, and also some a song example of the treatment of the fingers. That's the basal joint of the thumb. Here also a very good localization of the needle, good distribution of the contrast medium. That is the EP polysis the MCP, and here one example of the treatment in the PIP joint. And some example of the treatment, the lower extremity, here's the best place to inject it is the hip, that is the best place to uh, inject in the ankle, and here you see a treatment as first in the ankle, then the subtarsal joint, and this is the articulatio cuna naviglare, and this is the MTP1. Some example of a good therapeutic effect, here at the left side, you see arthritis in all the PIPs in the MCP1, uh, MCP2, and here in the right wrist. And one year later, after one radiosinovectomy, we have a complete response in all the fingers and no arthritis in the wrist, very good therapeutic effect. Let me conclude. Radiosinovectomy showed a very good therapeutic effect between 60 to 80%. And if you treat the patient very early, you can also have a therapeutic effect up to 90%. Um, and in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, it cannot replace the systemic therapy because radiosinovectomy is a local therapy and you need a good teamwork with the colleagues and a high degree of specialization if you will treat a patient with advanced stage of arthrosis. Thanks for your attention. Um, dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen, I am presenting a case of a 50-year-old male patient, grade 2 neuroendocrine tumor of the stomach, who was successfully treated by PRRT, peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, plus surgery, in this case endoscopic resection of the rest of the tumor after initial PRRT. Um, PRRT, peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, has become very important in the field of nuclear medicine and oncology because it has, has gained uh, tremendous results in recent years with uh, new radiopharmaceuticals, which are now registered for radionuclide therapy, in particular in the case of neuroendocrine tumor patients. So I show you this case. Next slide, please. Uh, of this uh, male patient who was recently in May 2018 diagnosed with a neuroendocrine tumor grade two of the stomach with a proliferation rate of 15 percent. Um, this uh, uh, tumor was um, um, was resected initially and then the patient had, an, uh, had a gallium total doc PET CT which showed multiple liver metastases. We have um, immediately decided after more than 20 years treating patients at the Medical University of Innsbruck 
to give this patient lutetium totatate peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. This patient received uh, the usual dose uh, activity of four cycles, resulting in a total of 29 gigs uh, in this patient over a period of approximately six months. So uh, this kind of treatment is usually given vaccinated just to be on the sure side because of some uh, adverse events that might occur to bone marrow and kidney. After this, the liver metastasis completely resolved on the gallium PET scan, but there was some rest in the stomach area. Therefore, we uh, can uh, think that this patient had at that time but, but, but partial remission. Patient underwent another gastroscopy and the rest of the tumor was resected uh, which showed a key I67 index, which is the proliferation rate of 1%. Thus, the patient came into complete remission over the last two years. The patient is still followed up, of course, and shows us the excess of the combination of endoscopy together with BRRT. So these are the slides now. Uh, showing you uh, the, the before pretreatment, the multiple uh, liver metastases uh, before on the left side and uh, right side after lutetium total death therapy, complete remission except of some rest in the stomach area. So this case shows us. Uh, how effective uh, PRRT can work in particular patients and shows us also personalized treatment of this novel combination therapy, surgery or gastroscopic resection together with PRRT. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear patients, I am the Director of Nuclear Medicine at the Medical University of Innsbruck and I have been working with WARMS, the World Organization um, of radio, on Radiopharmaceutical Therapy for uh, many years now and I'm going to present a case uh, uh, of a patient treated with um, peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. Uh, this is a very interesting case uh, because it shows different somatostatin analogs that were used over the years in a patient who responded uh, very good and is still alive. So the patient is a female patient aged, aged 69 years and she shows long-term disease control. And the story started in 1993 uh, when she was operated with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, at that time, she was diagnosed with indium dota lenreotide. Um, the liver metastases uh, that were indicated by this particular scan were then uh, surgically removed and she eventually had another indium dota octreotide. Uh, scan, uh, which led to the first um, uh, peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, PRRT, uh, at that time performed with itium 90 tota doc, um, long uh, an analog of, um, of octreotide. She received five cycles, altogether 10 gigs, and showed partial remission. First, and then uh, after uh, uh, several months complete remission and remained stable uh, five years, uh, where other and new metastases were indicated on a gallium dota doc PET scan. Effectively, she was one of the first patients in the world uh, scanned with gallium dota doc PET uh, CT at that time. 
Afterwards, uh, we decided to give her a second round of BRT, receiving lutetium totatate, four cycled, uh, cycles altogether, 29 gigs. And she again showed complete remission of the liver metastasis. Eventually, she relapsed in 2011 with a single liver metastasis, um, and she was thus having radiofrequency ablation therapy of this particular metastasis together with a third term of BRRT using again lutetium 177 TOTA TATE. I want to mention that throughout the whole performance of therapy over the years, the patient also received long-acting octeotide. The PET scans using FDG were always negative, and all the um, restagings were performed also always together with FDG and gallium dota talk over the years. She, re, uh, she was always in a very good um, healthy condition and showed a very good quality of life and is still, as I said, now uh, alive after so many years. So these were the first PET scans. Uh, you see the liver metastasis, which uh, uh, disappeared uh, over one year uh, used under itium dota talk. She was stable uh, after another uh, uh, treatment period with, with lutetium total date, 2009 here, the last uh, uh, slide on the right, um, uh, uh, the last column on this slide. And this uh, indicates now the liver metastasis, single liver metastasis, which was uh, treated by RFA together with a third term of BRRT, which showed stable disease until now. Just to show you how complex these therapies are, uh, therapies are given in cycles and restagings are performed with FDG and gallium, uh, total doc or total date every six uh, months. So uh, here you see a, a, the patient in 2005 on the left side with the liver metastasis, 2019 uh, was still in complete remission in both imaging modalities, gallium total doc and FDG PET. This case shows us that uh, retreatment is possible uh, with several and different somatostatin analogs is feasible and is um, safe also. Uh, it's, uh, this slide shows you the patient over the years and also me. You see there is not much difference after 25 years, only some uh, kind of aging. These pictures were taken with permission of the patient. I want to point out that regarding the use of FTG bed in patients with neuroendocrine tumors, WORMS is conducting a multicenter analysis and first data uh, all over the world were already presented at our last meeting in Nanjing, China in 2019. And the study is still recruiting and will probably be uh, finished in the next uh, couple of months. Thank you very much. And I hope this case shows you how uh, wonderful the treatment with PRC can act in uh, patients and how personalized nuclear medicine works nowadays. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Feng Wang, board member of WOMS and, uh, uh, and chairman of ICRT 2019. Uh, um, uh, to, um, and also, I'm uh, I'm also president of Nuclear Medicine Association in Jiangsu Province. After 2019 ICRT, the great attention have been achieved from the clinical, but also the health bureau. I'd like to thank Dr. Ireno, Dr. Richard Baum, and Josh. Many thanks for your help uh, for uh, uh, 2019 ICRT. For the, uh, for the celebration of the Diagnostic Day, uh, 31 um, March, I'd like to show great thanks for WOMS. It is WOMS 
that pro that promote uh 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 agnostic significantly and now uh agnostic uh Ha, has been uh, spread in the world and widespread in the world. I think seragnostic uh, will be the novel treatment strategy, not only the, in the neuroendocrine tumor, but also endocrine tumor, but also in the other solid tumors. I do believe. Today, I'd like to uh, share a very interesting case. Uh, this is a female patient because of the chest tightness and angina and sometimes uh, blood in the sputum. sputum. He referred to the uh, big hospital in China. Uh, uh, um, after, the, uh, after the image, after the examination, a uh, 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 big lesion can be found in the, uh, the medial sternum and the, the uh, and the pulmonary uh, artery, main branch of the pulmonary artery. Uh, uh, after biopsy in the left uh, left uh, left neck, pancreatoma pancreatoma was confirmed. It was confirmed, but uh, uh, but uh, the treatment the strategy is limited. So he came. Uh, so uh, he. Uh, she came to my department for the further, uh, further uh, treatment. Uh, fortunately, when he, uh, when she came to my department, uh, gallium labeled daughter uh, PET CT was performed. Was performed. We can find we we can find uh, we can find uh, significant uh, very significant uh, focal uptake can be found. Uh, can be found in the uh, main branch of the uh, pulmonary artery and the uh, uh, lymph node metastasis in the left neck. The uptake, uh, uh, the uh, the uptake, con uh, uh, consider the uptake. The clinical score was five. Or the clinical was five. Uh, after the M after the MDT, uh, uh, I think. Uh, and the export sink PRT has uh, was uh, uh, optimal treatment. Uh, so after three uh, cycle treatment, the total uh, dose was about seven hundred milliliters was used. Uh, we can from this image we can find uh, the left image is a baseline image. Uh, the right image the right image was uh, the uh, the image after three cycle treatment. We can find, uh, we can find the uh, the lesion was significant decreased. The uh, the uptake of the uh, the uptake uh, was significant decreased, uh, and uh, and uh, um, uh, more importantly, the uh, the tumor marker such as uh, chromogranin and uh, uh, NSE and the uh, can can. Uh, cantolamine was significantly decreased. Uh, from this table, we can find uh, the tumor volume was significantly decreased, and then the tumor size was significantly decreased, and the, as a as, uh, uh, simultaneous receptor uh, density was significantly decreased. I think uh, this patient had a good outcome and had a better response to PRT. I, uh, from, th from this case, we think uh, PRT was not only was not only very valuable in the treatment of uh, GP net, but also pheochromocytoma and pancreatomas. I think the uh, PRT uh, will uh, will be very useful in the uh, in the oncology, and I do think uh, uh, serologic is very very uh, useful in the uh, in the oncology. Uh, I think uh, I think uh, so, uh, serogenostic is also a very, very important part of the precision medicine. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Hi, how are you, colleagues, friends, and all the people of the world? 
I'm Mike Sartier, the president-elect of Warmth, and it's my great pleasure to celebrate with you the Theranostic Day, demonstrating the power of actinium PSMA in prostate cancer. This is what I would want to demonstrate. I'm having two cases here that are showing uh, the, the impact of actinium PSMA here. The first case, which I'm demonstrating here, as you can see, it's we've got this exceptional initial response of prostate cancer on lung metastasis on a person that actually has had to uh, not receive chemotherapy because they couldn't uh, afford it and they also refused it when they finally got to have it. And that's a person that also could not get their uh, medical castration and refused surgical castration. This person was symptomatic and had a PSA of 1,897. Just after one single of actinum PSMA, as you can see, extensive lung metastasis, no doubt this is skeletal metastasis, all of it had gone. And this person wouldn't obviously have responded so well had it, been, uh, had it not been actinum PSMA. This demonstrates that indeed actinum PSMA is an excellent option when we've got no options of other modalities or the patient is not willing to actually have any other treatments. You can see clearly that all the metastasis has actually resolved. The person subsequently went on to have two other therapies. And then of course the PSA was below zero after two therapies. But after single therapy, as you can see, the response was remarkable. And then now the other, page, the other case that I would want to, to demonstrate is on a case of a person that had, had progressed metastatic castrates, a prostate cancer, had gone on to progress and had a brain lesion, which was not uh, going to be treated by other means, such as external radiation. And after one single therapy, you can see from seven, the PSA was 7,800 and it went to 17 after single therapy, but the brain lesion had resolved as well. These two cases here demonstrate clearly that really acting on PSMA, it's a viable option where you don't have any other means of treating the metastatic prostate cancer. And then of course, it can also do well wherein we have lutetium therapy that has not actually uh, resolved in this case. Just to end up, I want to show you that again, this uh, kind of results are actually staying for long, showing that clearly you can see after two sessions of actinum PSMA, it is resolved. And then after three years, the person is still under remission. That's a different case, of course. And this has been demonstrated by a different group, which is Heidelberg. After five years, the person have resolved. So these uh, four cases, the one of lung cancer, the brain metastasis, and the chemo naive patients have responded well, demonstrating clearly that actinium PSMA is something to keep in mind when we have to really celebrate the diagnostic day and something that can be uh, utilized. We just have to resolve what do we do about making actinium PSA to be um, uh, available to all people that want to treat with it and have an SOP that is good that will be utilized by all very well. And I want to thank all of you for watching uh, this uh, video. Thank you so kindly.